Okay, yet another idea in terms of scaling. We've already talked about a little bit uh, in terms of dy dx, and that's this idea of layer two. So in the context of dy dx, uh, they basically are collecting all of the bids and the asks, the people wanting to sell or buy, and what they're willing to pay or sell at. They're collecting all that information in a layer two system. And I've described that as a multi-signature uh, uh, wallet. So this idea of layer two has been around for a while. Layer two is uh, operational in Bitcoin and Ethereum, but it's not as popular um, as people had hoped. And I'll go through a detailed example as to how it works. I believe it will become more popular in the future. And I think DYDX is a good example of an implementation that uh, makes a lot of sense. So essentially what's happening here is that uh, in the layer two, you can allow for a lot of small transactions at a very low fee, if there's any fee whatsoever. Um, and then only at certain points, you go out to the main chain. So it might be uh, an initial transaction to seed a vault, and it might be uh, a terminal transaction where we take uh, funds out of that vault, but everything that happens um, is basically within this vault, within the context of multi-signature uh, wallet. So this is especially useful for these uh, small transactions, and it's useful for things that aren't transactions yet, like a bid or an offer. So um, let's actually kind of go through to see how this, uh, this happens. And in a way, I've got this example of, of Coinbase is kind of providing something uh, similar um, that if you trade with Coinbase, it's a centralized exchange, uh, not all of their transactions are, uh, are on chain because they've got, think of it as a float where they're matching buyers and sellers. Uh, they don't need to worry about transferring the keys because they have custody over all the keys. So if somebody wants to buy a Bitcoin, but somebody wants to sell a Bitcoin, you just put them together. They don't need to do an on-chain transaction. If that person that buys eventually wants their private key, well, that's a different story. But uh, essentially, a lot of that stuff just goes on and they don't need to actually go to the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. Okay, so layer two provides something uh, similar, but it's uh, much more general, much more uh, secure. So let me go through uh, my example of layer two, which is not a DeFi example. It's me going to Starbucks and, and getting a coffee. And it doesn't make any sense for me to pay for the coffee with an on-chain transaction because the cost of the on-chain transaction is more than the cost of the coffee. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up um, a multi-signature address um, that is going to be shared between me and Starbucks. And this is how it's going to work. So what I will do is we're going to open um, this vault and I will deposit 0 0.05 uh, Ether. And Starbucks deposits nothing. And we've got a ledger where I've got uh, 0 0.05 and Starbucks has got zero. This is going to be the payment channel ledger. So this is an on-chain transaction, and it's really just a one-way transaction from me. So um, I see that I've got uh, the 0 0.05, so it's completely transparent, um, and Starbucks sees that I point zero five, And again, this is one transaction on-chain. So, so now let's think about me going to Starbucks, I order a coffee, and what we do is we just update the ledger that is off-chain, but again, multi-signature, so it's very secure. 
And you can see the new balance is that I go from 0 0.05 to 0 0.045, and Starbucks gets 0 0.005. So again, this is a very straightforward update of the ledger. So I could continue to buy coffee until the balance is exhausted. Uh, indeed, this could go the other way. If I don't like the coffee uh, or Starbucks gave me the wrong one, they could actually refund uh, to me uh, the cost of the coffee. But in this ledger, it gets down to 0 0.015 uh, for my account and uh, 0 0.035 for Starbucks. And again, we're doing multiple transactions. All of this is off chain and uh, there's no gas fee that's associated uh, with this. So at any time, either party can repatriate. So I could pull out my 0 0.015 at any point, and Starbucks can repa repatriate their um, 0 0.035 or any fraction of that. You can't take out more than you actually have. So Starbucks cannot touch my balance, and I can't touch theirs. But we can actually do an on-chain transaction to pull money out of the vault. So again, there's one transaction that is on-chain to seed the vault. Then there's another transaction on-chain to actually pull money out of the vault. But potentially within the vault, there could be thousands of transactions that happen that are off-chain, but are very uh, secure. Okay, so uh, again, this is really important that uh, there's no way that Starbucks can, uh, can touch my uh, coin. I've got complete control over my balance, and uh, I can't deal with their coin uh, either. And there's no way that, that Starbucks could block me from withdrawing my uh, coin. So that's very important. Um, and the other thing is that you might think, well, this is really potentially inefficient that I have to set up a wallet or a, a vault with Starbucks. Um, what, what if I don't have a, a vault with Starbucks? So let me introduce Amber. So Amber and I have a payment channel, but Amber doesn't have a payment channel with Starbucks. Amber wants a coffee at Starbucks. So, and you know where I'm going here, that there's actually two transactions that happen. There's one transaction where Amber sends the money for the coffee to my, uh, to the, the wallet that we share, Amber and I. And then I'm able to send from there to, uh, to uh, Starbucks. So it's a pass through. Okay, so this is a very cool idea because it allows for a network uh, effect. So in general, there's going to be all of these, uh, these channels and uh, within the layer two uh, network, you find the most efficient route to get from, let's say, Amber to Starbucks. And there's many different ways to actually do the route, but you want to have as few hops as possible. So again, what this allows is the, um, that not everybody has to have uh, these redundant uh, wallets that you can rely upon the network to get this particular uh, effect. So there's a number of concerns that are false with the, the layer two that, uh, that you're pre-funding uh, future payments. That's not really true because you're, it, it, it's like having a second wallet, right? So you, maybe a purse is a better example. You've got some one, Money in one purse, money in another purse. It's both, it's yours. Okay, so this is some pre-funding. It's just keeping your funding uh, somewhere else. Um, 
So there's other concerns like you don't want to lock up your fur, your, your funds, um, and use them uh, elsewhere. Well, again, that's evolving uh, also um, in that there will be protocols that will allow for uh, some rewards for some liquidity. Um, and this idea of closing and opening the channel, it's a real um, pain to do in terms of replenishing funds or pulling funds out. Uh, again, this completely depends upon the particular application. I've given a very simple application in terms of buying coffee at Starbucks. There are other applications like the DYDX uh, layer two applications where this is just completely um, irrelevant. So, so again, this is a, a good idea. You don't need to have hundreds of channels. You can have a few channels, and if enough people on the network have channels, then we can actually use this technology to actually, and the goal here is really clear. What we're doing is moving the smaller transactions off chain. Okay, so move small con um, transactions or move things that aren't quite transactions yet, like in DYDX. And effectively, when you do that, uh, it is increasing the number of transactions per second via the layer uh, two uh, technology.